Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. This is a little bit different CTE session. We're calling this Here for Peers. And our topic today is alternative assessment. With me today are a couple of colleagues, Clint Patterson with the center and also Holly. Where did you go, Holly? I'm looking for your screen so I can read your name and not miss it up. <laughs> Holly. Hannah. Hannah. Yes, okay. okay, there she is. She's waiting. All right, um, she's a graduate student with us, and they are helping monitor chat and handle various things for us behind the scenes today. Uh, we're going to be pretty informal today with uh, introductions. Uh, so, oh, my name is June Lane. I'm the instructional consultant at the center. I'm the facilitator for today's fun. And I'm going to kick this over to our two faculty guests so they can introduce themselves. And then I'll say a few things about definitions for today, and we'll get started. So, Katie, you want to kick us off? Howdy, I am uh, Katie Stoddard. I'm an instructional associate professor in the Department of Plant Pathology and Microbiology. So I teach in the undergraduate program of bioenvironmental sciences. And I have been here since 2015. I'm super excited to be here today to talk about alternative assessments. Um, my name is Katrina Laporte. I am a cultural anthropologist in the College of Liberal Arts and my passion is teaching. Um, I'm an instructional associate professor like Katie. She just got promoted, so, or it should go the other way. It's like the, you never know which way it's going to be. She just got promoted, so congratulations, Katie. And um, we're here today to talk about alternative assessments, which is something that uh, Katie and I are incredibly passionate about. So hopefully you'll get something out of today. All right, I'm sharing a screen from an Articulate Rise module that's available on our website. Topic is alternative assessment. And the table that you see in front of you helps do some defining of what we mean when we talk about alternative assessment. Now, there's no right or wrong associated with any of this. It's just simply a point of clarification to make sure that people know what they have available uh, that they might be able to use for um, whatever their assessment needs are in the class. So alternative assessment generally refers to types of assessment that go beyond asking students to just let us know what they know, but also to show us what they can do with what they know. And alternative assessments are also often known as authentic assessments because they can involve allowing students to practice, to demonstrate, and to mimic the kinds of things that they're going to be asked to do in a work environment or as professionals. So I'm going to stop there and leave this table up and see if that leads to any, any questions to fine tune the definition, any concerns, our uh, guests for today may have additional things to add to that. Um, okay, Katie, you go first and I'll- yes, you know, do, you, do you want to clarify about, um, because when you and I met originally at the beginning of the summer, we talked about assessment in terms of assessment for OIE versus, mm -hmm. so there's, there's assessment for the assessment of your academic program, and then there could be assessment that you're just assessing how um, learning is happening in your course. And one, I just didn't know if you right. wanted to talk about that at all. No, that's a really good point. So in this case, what, what this guide is about and what we're, uh, majoring on today, although we can touch on the other, is the idea of assessing learning in your class primarily. Now that feeds into the other question of program assessment and the kind of things that you do um, in APHIS, for example, now for OIE. But here we're, we're mainly focused on the decisions that you're making about how to uh, tell how much learning and what type of learning is happening in your course. So what your options are across the spectrum from traditional and more conventional types of assessment like a multiple choice exam that is uh, automatically graded in the LMS, for example, or an exam where you have to uh, proctor it um, while it's going in the LMS um, versus alternative or authentic type tasks, which may not be machine gradable and, and may not require proctoring because of the nature of what you're asking the students to do. But there's a lot of moving parts to this, which is why we've got two experienced instructors here to talk about what this looks like in practice. It's actually interesting you should say that, Jean, because one of the um, one of the things that just stuck out to you is um, 
the real world portion of it and I never really thought about it that way before. One of the questions I get from my students is um, when I assign them these alternative assessments um, is uh, what format do you want it in? And it's a very uh, interesting conversation to have with them because I then say, imagine you are working for me and I'm your boss and I give you a task. Would you then say to your boss, what format do you want this thing in? They say to me, um, well, what format do you want it in? Do you want it in 12 point font with the uh, one inch margins with MLA size and all the rest of it? And I'm like, um, if, you were, if I was your boss, would you ask that? And they're like, no. And um, I'm like, uh, you know, you give it to me in whatever format is necessary for you to convey the information to me. All right, thank you for that. So I'd like for each of you, if you would, to describe the context of the course where you're using authentic assessment, the, the level of students that are in it, the enrollment count in it, so people will have a good idea of the situation that you have for using the methods that you're gonna talk about today. So I, so I started this started this uh, over the summer when I had in a 200 level course with about 36 students, and then I've continued it in the fall. I now have another 200 level course, all online asynchronous, and I have about 146 students in that class. And then I have another class that's a 400 level class, a junior senior level class, and that one has about 23. And I'm using an alternative or authentic assessments in that class as well. And I first started doing it about maybe five years ago when I developed a course for engineering as an alternative course to Engineering 482. It was the anthropological offering. Um, at its greatest capacity, I was um, doing uh, three, uh, 300 students a semester in uh, 12 sections of 25, 12 sections of 25, uh, and it was also writing intensive. Um, so the, in those classes, there was no exams, no pop quizzes, no nothing, anything to give a student undue anxiety. And uh, now I have uh, 64 students in one class and uh, 54 students in another class. So I've done it from 300 down to 54. All right, thank you. That gives everybody a, an idea of the context, which is, I think, going to be key, certainly in our, we got one question ahead of time yesterday, and it had to do with, with course size and support uh, involving this, which is why I wanted to make sure that we, we got that out there before we moved on. So let's talk about, and we'll go back to Katie on this one, what motivated you to adopt alternative assessment methods? So one thing I was was tired of is hearing about my students cramming, knowing that they didn't study anything until the night before the exam, and then they'd forget things later. Um, I was looking for something that was more authentic. I also had a lot of students that would tell me that um, they had trouble taking an exam. They're like, how do I best study for your exams? The, one of the other things was I was, was worried about so I do teach a class online whether we're in COVID or not and so trying to have that class assessed um, and wanting to avoid the online exams for academic honesty reasons and having too many, having too many students in a, um, a online class taking an exam at the same time um, I may, may or may not have contributed to crashing eCampus at one point in the past that way. So um, I was looking for something that was a little bit more authentic and could help students creatively um, show what they've learned and also just to have more excitement about learning rather than constantly asking me, is this on the exam? So those are some of my motivations. Yeah. Um, I think you've hit a lot of hot points there. Katrina? My motivation was purely selfish. Um, I was a non-traditional student. I didn't get off on the U lecture. I take exams. In fact, it gave me a huge amount of anxiety. Um, that was not my style of learning, although I know that that's not, um, that's not a kosher way of describing learning anymore, that people have different learning styles. But there's some credence in it because I was very much a doing kind of active learner. 
that needed to talk with people about what I was uh, learning and experiment with it and draw connections with other things that I was doing. So um, for me, it started with just trying to reduce the amount of anxiety in the classroom and make the learning more enjoyable for both me and the students. Okay, there's several similarities there that I noticed in the motivations. So would you describe for us, where does alternative assessment fall in the course timeline? And we'll go back to Katie. So I'll just, uh, I'll just discuss my lower level course, which has more students. Um, so that one has, it falls in a variety of places. So uh, there are weekly tasks that they do. I call them their weekly module tasks. So there's something weekly that they're going to uh, take the content that they're learning about that week and I ask them to do something with it, to create something. So that's one. But then there's also usually, there's a unit thing that they're gonna have to do. So they think collectively about the material in the unit and they create something and they write something based off of that. So it happens in multiple places across the term. I also have a team project that spans the course of the term that includes authentic assessment as well. So really it's, almost at every level. Um, to answer that question, Jean, um, I actually, from day one, they have something due nearly every class. Um, so that they're constantly engaged throughout the semester and not just two or three main points. So they have a motivation to come every time and to attend class or to be participatory in the class because they're bringing something to the class to contribute to the classroom discussion. So there is, uh, I know a class I taught last semester, my theory class, um, there was actually 27 touch points throughout the class. Uh, and so I know I can see Dale asking questions, I can see Nancy asking questions, do you have TAs? And uh, no, not always. And some of the methods I'm gonna to discuss today actually don't require you to do the grading of the assessment. I know everybody's just breathed a sigh of relief to hear you say that. <laughs> like, I know oh, I breathe okay. a sigh of relief as well. <laughs> exactly. So let's explore a little bit exactly what you're trying to assess. And, and you probably hinted at this when you talked about the motivations, but let's be explicit about the kinds of things that you're trying to assess or more um, directly maybe, what are you able to assess using alternative methods that you really weren't getting using more traditional or conventional methods? I would say the first and foremost is critical thinking. That one is really difficult to assess in a multiple choice question or a multiple choice question exam. So that would be my first one would be critical thinking. Um, and then also higher level Bloom's taxonomy such as analyze, evaluate, creating. Those are things that I'm assessing. And wrapped up in that is technical competency or technical knowledge because you can't do those things without the technical knowledge um i would i would say actually critical thinking is probably num the number one thing that i'm assessing i'm also assessing their communication skills the courses i teach are icd that involve the communication and a social and a personal responsibility so I'm assessing that in addition to the giving the students the latitude to be creative and synthesize their knowledge on multiple levels so they can take what they learn in the classroom with what they've explored outside, bring it together and synthesize it and then hypothesize on that. So as Katie said, aiming really high on Bloom's taxonomy um, and doing some of the really, really simple, um, just regurgitating learning uh, in a module of some kind. So we've established this does some things for us that other types of assessment for a variety of reasons have not. So let's talk specifically, and this is where share screen may come in handy for the, our guests. Um, what are students asked to do that is alternative or different from traditional assessment? So let's talk specifically about the kinds of assignments, examples of the things that you're doing in your class. Do you want to go first, Katie? Sure. Um, there, there are a lot of different things that I've, I've had my students do. So in the weekly module tasks in my 201 class, I, I try to think of something new that they can do or create each week. Um, 
And so, uh, and also including some reflection in it. So um, this week I'm asking them to make an instructional resource. So my first choice was a Sway. If you aren't familiar with Sway, it's one of the new tools in Microsoft 365. And it's super helpful. It, it, it works really well and fairly easy, but I also gave them the opportunity to create a PowerPoint. And so I told them, you're gonna take a concept from this week's module or this week's um, content and um, we're, we're doing, doing chapters five and six. And I wanted them to create something to teach one topic to a friend, a roommate, a family member. And then they use that instructional resource that they're going to teach with. They teach the topic and then they have to reflect on what the process was like and how that what they would do to change their instructional um, their instructional um, creation, their instructional um, tool, and um, what that process was like to try to teach it. Some other things that I've had students do is they've had to create um, and think up and design an experiment. They've had to create infographics. Uh, I've had them, one task I really enjoyed doing last semester was I had them identify, they did a, um, they estimated their ecological footprint at the beginning of the semester. And then I challenged them to track one element of their ecological footprint. Um, so for example, the number of minutes they showered. Um, and so I, I had them track data all through the semester. And then at the end of the semester, I had them do uh, the calculator again. And they also had to create a graph from their data and analyze it and talk about it, about what changed, what they, what the data actually show. Um, I also have students do concept maps. Another thing I'm gonna have students do is write a memo about, uh, I'm gonna have them find a chemical in one of their personal care products and write a memo about that chemical. So any number of things, I, there's a variety of things that they, that I have them do. Um, but I try to make it every, every week it's something different that they're, they're making something, they're creating something. Um, I, I have all, almost always called them module tasks. Um, so students have module tasks throughout the course of the semester. Um, I used to call them quick tasks and then the students reminded me that they weren't actually so quick and they would go down the rabbit hole and that they weren't real, so that I, I stopped calling them QTs and now they're called MTs. Um, but they have module tasks and um, on this handout that Jean will share with you later, I actually have a rubric that I use for every single module task. It's a very simple rubric that I've just, that I use in every class. It's very easy to use. It's applicable across the board with every question that I ask. Um, and basically the students on the first week of class, because they're not used to this form of assessment, will, I'll give them the rubric, I'll get them to pull out their work and I'll get them to grade themselves using this rubric. And then I get two of their peers to grade each other's work and then they know how to get a 10 out of 10 or a five out of five or a four out of four. So she's gonna share this rubric with you. But the module tasks I'll give them are something like, I might give them a selection of readings to do. I'll say, here's a whole selection of readings, choose three that float your boat and write about them. Here's another module task where I actually give them a task to do. Um, they work through a little module that I've pr provided for them and then they've got a task to do and always uh, quite often there's uh, a choice for them so they have some direction in their own learning so they can choose module task one or module task two. In this case they either have to um, write a small essay based on another essay that they've read or they have to talk to a stranger and get to know that stranger. Um, another module task might be to watch a movie with a guided set of questions and respond to these questions. Um, this was another module task where they had to go down a rabbit hole. I gave them three rabbit holes to go down with a few different um, scenarios and they were able to go down them and then answer some questions. Um, and so they're kind of like the module tasks. Other types of alternative forms of assessment, do we want to go there right now, Jean? Is that okay? Yes, sure. Okay, so here's a really crazy idea. Get the students to grade their own participation. I'll share this with you, but this is some of the data I've collected from my class. 
Um, this is them grading their own participation twice during the semester. In, uh, in, um, in hindsight, the students are far more um, harsh on themselves as far as participation than I would ever be. Uh, so participation is never more than 10% of my grade. I take it as two touch points throughout the semester, halfway and at the end. These, this, is the, uh, this is the guiding questions on how I get them to grade their participation. And here's a kind of like a distribution of responses. You would expect them all, them, all of them to give themselves 10 out of 10, but they don't. In fact, we've got some students here giving themselves 6 out of 10, and then I get them to justify why they are giving themselves. And this speaks to personal and social response responsibility, which is one of the guiding um, criteria of an ICD class. Um, I, I shared some of the comments that the students gave with themselves. Um, you can see here that not everyone is giving themselves 10 out of 10, and they tell me what they can do to improve their attendance and their participation in the class, which is really quite, I think this is quite eye-opening. Other alternative forms of assessment that I don't actually have to grade, um, I use a system called Peerceptive, which is a calibrated peer review of writing. Um, I can benchmark the grades, but I don't have to. Uh, and then they get a lot of feedback from other students on their writing. So Peerceptive is another strategy. And another strategy I use is perusal. And I don't know if any of you have used this, but this is collaborative reading. How many of you have problems getting your students to read? That's a question. I'm not used to seeing so many blank screens in my classroom. Well, it probably <laughs> means everyone. It uh, probably <laughs> means everybody, right? Um, I, I assign uh, some really funky reading sometimes and it's like, uh, wow. So, and I could never get them to read. So perusal is a free tool that's developed by Harvard University. It's a uh, collaborative reading. And you can see here, how many of you can get your students to read for two and a half hours and make 230 comments in the text and answer each other's questions. And then this system automatically grades them and gives them a grade that feeds straight back into the grade book. It's really amazing. Um, I use polling in the classroom and index cards as a form, a form of assessment, very low stakes assignments. I've got some videos on that too. Um, and I'm started to use Padlet, which is really cool, um, which you can integrate into Zoom. This was a tell me about yourself, little five point assignment that they had to do where they had to think reflexively about their place in the world and who they were, uh, post a picture. So I'm using, uh, I think that's the end of mine, I'll stop the share, but I know that Jean is going to share that with you. Um, but I have like lots of different types of um, alternative assessment going on, the, the, it's endless. I'm developing new ones every day. Okay, so I'm seeing some questions. Yes. Uh, for the collaborative reading, how are the copyright issues? It's no different, um, um, Eric, uh, to um, putting a PDF in eCampus or in Canvas. Um, in fact, one of my good friends, Asha Rao, in biology has just put a whole open stacks inside perusal for collaborative reading of the textbook. Um, the, how the perusal get their money is um, they are hoping that maybe you'll use a whole textbook and get the students to buy it and then you'll put it into perusal. But if you just use PDFs of or chapters from a, from a textbook, there's no cost, there's no copyright issues. And no, the, book, the books don't have to be open source. You can use, go and speak to the copyright editor at the library, I've forgotten her name, she's amazing. But you can use like four or five chapters in a book and not be violating copyright. Um, do you know if these free tools are compatible with Canvas? They will be. At the moment, the Canvas implementation is so overwhelmed, but eventually I'm sure that they will uh, enable LTIs like Perusal and, um, and Peerceptive. But other things that you can do just simply with index cards and collect them in the class and give low stakes points. The key here is low stakes assessment, low, low stakes assignments and lots of them. Yeah, I will I'll second that both Katrina Katrina and I use Peerceptive and that I know there was a question about how do you manage 600 students. So I'll say just speak very briefly about Peerceptive. It's a beautiful system. So I one of the ways that I use it is my students uh, write worldview assessments or worldview reflections. And so I give them 
I give them a topic that in environmental science that doesn't have a right or wrong answer, but they have to tell me what they think, what their worldview is. So a good example is, um, do you believe a country has the right to tell their citizens how many children they should have, hearkening to the one child policy that China once had? And then when they explain what their worldview is, they have to incorporate course concepts, concepts define them, and then they have to reflect on how they formed their full worldview. So I used to do this where that my TNA, TA and I read these and we had 200 coming in every two weeks and it was impossible. Like you can't, you can't give good feedback on that. And so we use perceptive. And so what the students do is a double blind, um, double blind um, calibrated peer review software. The students submit their writing in perceptive. It gives them an alias or an, um, a pseudonym. And then uh, once you're past the submission date, you go into the peer review stage, at which point you tell the students how many you have to do, how many peer reviews they have to do. The students peer review each other. There's um, the student, the program takes all of that data and it, it makes it so that you can benchmark the data. So or you benchmark the submissions. And so the program will tell you these are the top five, these are the bottom five. You grade those and then it will calibrate based off of your, it'll calibrate all the scores that were given based off of your grading and then give the students grades. And the students also give feedback on how helpful the reviews they receive from their peers are. So the reason I like it so much is I can grade, I can get students a lot of feedback very, very quickly without um, being overwhelmed by any, by hundreds of, of essays, but it also really helps the students that they get their grade from multiple checkpoints in there. So they get their grade from writing, they get their grade for how accurate their reviews were compared to yours, and they get a grade based off of did they do their tasks, did they do the peer review, did they do the back evaluation or giving feedback to their peers. So peer subjective is a really great way to manage um, writing assignments in a high volume course. Um. Uh, just to add to that, uh, I learned about a perceptive or I learned about perceptive and then I found someone who was just a, a wonderful person for using it. Um, uh, Craig Coates in entomology, he teaches a very, very large section of undergrad entomology classes using perceptive um, and he enables alternative assignment formats as well. So people can create YouTube videos, they can create PowerPoints, they can write written essays. And the it allows the students to be creative and uh, uh, create work that they would do in the real world for their boss, um, not just a written paper with one inch margins. Um, Dale, I wanna uh, uh, um, just uh, answer your question about Perusal. Perusal was developed by Eric Mazur of um, of uh, Harvard University, and he is a physicist, and he uses it for physics textbooks. So I'm sure that it would handle engineering and science. To address, oh. um, Shelley had a question. Do you have any evidence that alternative assessments are as good or better than traditional assessments? What I wouldn't say about this, and um, when I dived into this world of alternative assessments, I consulted with Katrina, I consulted with Jean, and I consulted with Craig Coates. And what I will say is that you'll find that your students may not have as, it may not go as broad, but they can go deeper on certain topics. So um, I know Craig Coates does um, alternative assessments. And so he's, I think in his course that he does entomology. And so the students have an intimate knowledge of five insects rather than a superficial knowledge of 20. So it, it's going to be slightly different, but it's it just depends on what your what you want your students to come out out the other end with. And what I was looking for was not my students to memorize something for an exam and then forget it two months later. I was looking for a more uh, a deeper level of learning and for students to actually learn and become something. So I only thought I thought that it would be better if they actually did something, created something to transform. Yeah. It is truly and sometimes completely transformative. I have students that I taught the equivalent of engineering ethics to five years ago, whom are now in industry and are still sending me case studies and examples of lessons that they learned five years ago. So I don't, I don't think that happens when you give, um, I, I mean, I think everything has its place is what I'm saying, but I think that 
this is an opportunity for students to really shine, be creative, go deep, go down the rabbit hole and explore. Fascinating. So our next question um, has to do with the, the challenge of grading, which you've already gotten pretty deeply into in terms of methods for managing the grading load, particularly when you have larger sections and you're trying to do this. But I want to extend this and, and have you talk about the prep time difference that's involved in that. Because when you use tools like uh, Perceptive, for example, you're essentially front loading the, the prep for the class in, in some ways so that that massive grading load that you sometimes have with more traditional assignments and assessments that hits you later in the semester uh, isn't so much of a problem. So I would agree that there there absolutely is front loading with Perceptive, um, but I think it works out well. Um, and I will tell you that that I I tried something this semester and it failed epically. Um, I did not front load, and I discovered that doesn't work like that. Um, I tried I tried to do something midstream and it didn't work. So um, you know it, you learn you learn from your mistakes and you move on. But the I'd say that. I, I adopted after talking with Katrina about this over the summer, I adopted the same rubric that she has of really 100%, 80%, 60%, 0% um, to show that's, um, it's, I can show, share my screen and show what that looks like in mine. Um, so that here's, this was an example of one of my assignments. I asked them to develop and review flowcharts, brainstorms and solutions. So they had to create a flowchart that identified causes and consequences of an environmental issue. And then they had to draw their flowchart out. I suggested that they use a Miro board. If you're not familiar with Miro board, it's amazing. You can get a free educational account, but essentially it allows students to do um collaboration by putting virtual sticky notes on a virtual board and they can move the sticky notes really good for flow charts for collaborating so i had them create a flow chart they had to brainstorm a solution for their flow chart they had to come up with a finalized solution and then explain how that solution um explain their solution in a post and so i I give my students um, characteristics of effective feedback because one thing I have found is you need to teach them how to give effective feedback because a lot of the times they just want to be nice to their friends. And so we really had to have to have a discussion about what is constructive feedback actually look like and what does it mean and what does it not mean. And remember, it's not about you as a person. It's about the quality of your work and an opportunity for you to learn how to improve. Um, but then in terms of the the rubric, let's see if I can make that bigger. This is a rubric for one, a task that includes um, in, involvement with others or um, engagement with others. And so there's the module task itself was 60%. And so this is very, very similar to um, Katrina's, if not word for word. I've adjusted it for some other ones. And then uh, there's 40% is associated with their um their interaction with their peers so in terms of the grading for perceptive there is yes you are going to have to front load you need to prepare that ahead of time you also need to prepare that schedule for what that looks like the students need enough time to do the creation enough time to do the peer review and then the back evaluation or the review the reviews for their peers so i learned uh two weeks ago that you can't just pop yourself down into a perceptive and um, it's it's better if you have that planned out from the beginning. Um, so that would be my thought there is um, plan your perceptive out from the beginning. Otherwise, it it's a little bit rough. When I first started using perceptive, uh, it was a conversation with the students every week. I would say, now how did that go? What do you think? I'm open to learning about this. This is new. Um, those conversations happen very frequently in the first four or five weeks of the class where the students are learning that you are going to assess them and using a different methodology. Um, so I want to address, because I, I, I often get people asking me about this who come from the STEM field and they say, yeah, that's well and truly good enough for you. Um, you can do writing, but I don't do writing, I do math problems. Um, we had a, a really amazing professor work with us. His name is J.D. Kim. He's in the math department. Um, uh, he was part of the 21st century building team. And 
he was really struggling with the whole concept of active learning and he ended up going to a conference and he came back from that conference a changed man um he said to me before he went that he couldn't possibly do active learning with math problems and he couldn't do alternative forms of assessment and during that conference he developed a module um, with the help of other people um, to it's a really interesting thing he he told the students you are going to be sending care packages to the military in afghanistan or wherever and i need you to calculate the best square volume for this package to send this 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 and this and so he gave them real world problems that they could get their teeth into and come back and solve so david i see your question there about programming i mean i can i'm not a, a computer scientist or a programmer but i could think of some amazing things that little problems that you could give them that are real world and applicable to them to solve um, so that they can go down the rabbit hole and start thinking through that. Do you agree? You can turn your microphone on and talk. Uh, yeah, um, I've approached this mostly about how to deal with it with grad students and I do definitely give them uh, shorter assignments like that. I also um, uh, use a larger sort of course project as sort of an access that ends up involving large levels of, you know, I don't a large project that doesn't involve me looking at their code, but me really evaluating how well they're interpreting the things that come out of them using their code to do data analysis. Yeah. And I'm just sort of exploring now that I've gotten a request to develop this material at the undergrad level where a big course project it doesn't make as much sense as something for an access. Uh, it's not something that really, like for a graduate student, of course, doing something that would be a publication level yeah. sort of paper, that makes sense, but not for undergrads so much. And so mm -hmm. I'm kind of trying to feel my way towards what would be the appropriate sort of evaluation there so I can yeah. keep it sort of focused on what are the skills that they're gaining. What's really surprised me is that the more that I've pushed the boat, the more the students have come on board and they're hungry to do more. Um, and so giving them that opportunity to do more um, in a comfortable space where they can fail um, and come back and discuss those failures and know that that's not going to tank their grade just because they learned something from the failure of that one assessment. So ultimately it comes back to multiple little bits of assessment so that they have the opportunity to still make an A in the class even if the first few times they don't get it right. I see a couple of questions in the chat that I wanted to, to build on as well. So um, beyond our understanding is that these methods reduce stress, does the literature demonstrate a relationship between student mental health and authentic assessment? I don't know of that. I would love to dive into that and see. Um, one thing I will say that I've gotten feedback from students, they, one student told me this is equally stressful um, but I don't have to stress about the test. I don't have test anxiety over this. The stress just comes from um, knowing that like I need to, the stress comes from things that they put on themselves or their own expectations. And one thing that I try to help students with is I let them know what I'm expecting out of the tasks. And one thing I tell them is I'm not looking, sometimes I'm not looking for a perfect refined product. So for my infographic assignment, I tell them, I'm expecting that you'd spend about an hour and a half to two hours on this. And what you have after that is a rough, a rough, rough out thing or a rough, um, a rough product. I'm not expecting perfection. So I tell my students that from the get go, that every week, it's not about creating the perfect thing. Every week, it's about demonstrating what you have learned and showing your learning as you go along. And so I try to be very authentic with them about that. And I think building on what Katrina said, it's really important that they understand that there's room for failure and there's, and you've accounted for that and there's, there's value in it. And so failing on something really just reflects that, okay, what have I learned from that and how can I move forward? And in my class, really, I've learned that I've set it up. So the students will really get the grade that they put the effort in for and, um, they no longer have to cram for an exam. So that stress, that stress has gone. So the stress now is in putting forth the effort to make sure they've learned what they need to learn through the course content and then use it to create something. 
Um, so I, I, I'm very interested to hear, to see if there's any link between student mental health and authentic assessment. That would be very interesting to me. Um, and there was one other question. Oh, the using alternative assessments for non-writing. So I'm doing that um, in my upper division class. We have, uh, they have to go through stat calculations for determining the number of samples that they need to, um, to sample us like a hazardous waste site. And so this last week we learned how to do the calculations and I gave them example problems. And so this week I told them it's now your turn to write a problem. So they, I twisted, twisted it on them and I said, you write the example problem, you work out the math. And so I tell them on page one, that's your questions. And on page two, it's your solutions. And then I tell them to post that they're gonna put it in a discussion board and then their task as the engagement part is to work or solve the problems of their two peers and then check their answers on page two yeah. and then give their peers feedback on how they could improve their question. So then the students really have to, they have to know the math in order to work it right. And they have to be able to create the question. So that's one thing that I'm doing with a non writing example. It's um, that's really interesting because I took this uh, course through the University of Madison, Wisconsin, and one of the professors there, he introduced this concept to me really early on. I know that the uh, the learning triangle with it is being uh, disbanded, Gene, is that right? Where, you know, teach someone else, you retain 90% of it versus just listen and you only retain 10%. But I do think there's some credence in that. Like if you have the opportunity to teach others, then you're going to retain more than if you just listen to someone talking about it. And so one of the one of the alternative assessments could be to write a multiple choice question and the students realize how hard it is to write a good multiple choice question. And then this uh, professor at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, he would collate all those questions into the study guide for the class and choose the two best questions that the students had created and included on the quiz. So there was kind of like bragging rights, my question got on the quiz, but it also um, became the study guide, unedited for the students to study together. So they were helping one another. Um, Elizabeth, you've done that, that's great. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to address a, a question that Shelley came up against and which is, the, um, you know, like the detractors who'll say it's fluff or you're invading the grade, um, you, you're artificially inflating the grade curve. Um, I used to have to deal with the guys in engineering who told me this when I was teaching the alternative to engineering ethics. Um, and a normative bell curve is a population without intervention what you're doing with good teaching is you're intervening so you can expect to see the bell curve move. Um, I do have a greater percentage of A's and B's in my class, but I think it's because the students put in a lot of friggin' work. So I want to go over to our next question. You've already touched on a lot of this. It, it has to do with uh, the student response, describing the student response. And you've talked about they're, they're doing more work there, it's, it's deeper over breadth of knowledge. Uh, you've alluded to several things here, but, but what's their reaction? I mean, for example, if they give you feedback during the semester or they come to office hours or on the end of term uh, student evaluation an opportunity, what are they telling you about alternative assessment versus traditional assessment? You wanna go, Katie? Sure. So I think at the beginning, the students see no exams and like, no exams. They get so excited and they're like, oh, this is going to be the easiest thing ever. And then they realize, no, no, that's not because they, I think they, they figure out quick is like, oh, I really have to know my stuff because I can't create if I don't know. Um, so they get really excited. And I think even they're still excited even after that realization comes to them. Um, they, they've told me it takes, um, that they're excited about the fact that they can think creatively, that they can interact with the course material in a little bit more of authentic way, that um, they like being able to engage with the course material without having the anxiety of a test. Um, let's see what else that I've, I wrote some things down about this. Um, they liked that um, the outcome uh, of the course, this plays to, um, I think Shelly's question, the outcome in the course really is 
you get exactly what you get out of it, what you put into it. And that if you teach, when I teach this way, that's exactly what comes out. So if a, put, a student puts in C-level work, they know what they're going to get if they're putting in C-level work. The guess, the guessing work is done, like it's gone because they're not going to guess as to, well, okay, what am I going to get on the exam? So um, they have a lot more control of their grade. And I think some students love that and some students may not like that. Um, but students have told me they took more away from the course, um, but it was still necessary that they read and they be engaged. And to some extent it was more because they couldn't hide behind um, just waiting for the exam to come around in a couple of weeks. Like, I think one thing I've noticed with my course this semester, and I've actually had multiple 8.30 p.m. meetings over Zoom with my students um, to talk about this, but I talked to them about this course expects you to be engaged like you're gonna have to check in multiple times a week engage with your peers engage with me engage with the course because that's how learning is going to happen and i think they're so used to coming to class taking notes turning off until three weeks later when they cram for an exam and they study they're so used to that model that when you change it on them it takes a little bit of an adjustment and they they it takes them a little while but i think that they most of them seem to uh, seem to like this. One thing that I am trying to be very cognizant of, I've always tried, is I don't want the technology to be the barrier for their learning. So I tell them, um, so I, this week they're making a sway, and I told them, you know, spend, here's how you do it. These are the help resources. But if you start going down this road and you're discovering that something's not working or you can't get the process to work, you can't get the software to work, I give them an alternative because I never want it to be, I couldn't get a website to work. That's not what should be the reflection of their learning. No, that's what I'd say. I, she's covered it all, but I just want to say, in general, it takes about four to five weeks. We're just getting to that stage now in the semester where the students understand where you're coming from. Um, you know, they're so conditioned into you sit and take a lecture, take notes, study those notes, take an exam, um, that they think that that's the modus operandi and they don't really believe that you're gonna do it differently. Um, so it takes four or five weeks for them to come around. So in, early in the semester, I build in a lot of kind of like uh, very low stakes assignments or peer reviewed kind of of your work so you have an opportunity to um, to fail and learn and grow. The other thing is is that I taught I'm teaching a class this semester that I haven't taught for two and a half years uh, anthropology of religion and in that class I have well over 50 percent of the students that have taken a class with me before have enrolled in the class simply because they like the way that I teach. So um, if you, I don't know whether it's got anything to do with their anxiety levels or whether they enjoy it more or whatever, but they all came back for more. So, yeah. I wanted to address Shelley's question about, um, have you encountered more issues with cheating? So this gives me a great opportunity to talk about something else. So. I don't think that I have mostly because I spend a lot of time at the beginning of the semester hearkening to what is academic honesty. And I've done that through an academic honesty quiz and I'll put the link in there for it. So I published this on the Oak Trust for A&M. Um, but really it's a it's an intense academic honesty quiz where I give the students um, there's 19 21, 19 or 21 questions, where I give them a scenario and they have to identify what type of academic honesty it is. I tell them the resources that they need to read, which are the, the Aggie Honor Code rules, which include the definitions of cheating, plagiarism, multiple submission, and it also includes examples. So I built my quiz based off of that. And they also have to read the sanctions of what will happen to me if I break these rules. And so in my course, the students have to master this quiz before they can move on and do anything. And I tell them, it doesn't matter. I don't care when you do it, but the due dates start in week two. So it's in your best interest to finish this quiz in week one so that you can move on and do stuff in week two. And the quiz is so intense that I think I, wake them, <laughs> I wake them up because now I have students coming to me asking me, can I do this? What do you think, would this be academic honesty? And so I know that since I'm doing that, um, 
I, I really let them know these are the standards to which you're held and you are held to them whether you understand them or not. So I'm trying to do you a favor and helping you to understand what it is. So I would say that I don't, I don't think I have problems with cheating because I um, put the put the fear in them at the beginning and let them know exactly what they're held accountable to. And then I use um, just plagiarism checkers along the way and I'll tell them all it, I'll do it. Did you want to speak to the academic integrity question, Katrina? I've had my problems with academic integrity and I've dealt with them over the years. Uh, a few years back, I um, had three students um, separated from the university. I have an intimate knowledge of the guys with Tim Powers' office. Um, I've become very familiar with the use of Turnitin um, and I also drill at home. Um, but one thing that really helped was I have them turn it through, turn it in um, and give a report immediately. Um, that way they know whether they're um, plagiarizing or not. Um, I did try and implement Katie's um, test, but I couldn't pass it myself. So <laughs> I'm just joking, but it's a, it's a really good tool and I use it in, I used it in one of my classes, yes. I've had colleagues tell me that they'll do students pass it to 90%, which um, will probably also get you what you're looking for. It is a tough, tough one. Um, if you follow that Oak Trust, it, um, the download is the questions itself. And I tell you that you need to email me with proof that you are some kind of instructor so that the, the answers aren't floating in the ether. But um, the, now that I've created the questions and the questions and the answers, um, I think it's a lot easier for instructors to execute this because you have the key and the key includes the feedback for both the correct answer and the incorrect answer. So if you have students that email you and um, email you about one of the questions, you can just look to the key and say, okay, you might consider these things. So Katie, you alluded to the fact that you had an epic fail earlier in the semester. And I, I thank you for your transparency on that. I wanna come back to that though and ask the question of about how long does it take to create an alternative assessment assignment and, and have it work the way you want? Does the high percentage work the first time you do them or does it take a couple of semesters? What would you say? Well, I, I guess it's good that you have both Katrina and I on here because this is my second semester of being both feet in the water of um, alternative assessments. And I can tell you that I'm still fine tuning things. I, I started over the summer and I had a five week course and I did module tasks in that course. And um, I've been fine tuning the instructions for each of those module tasks in my course this semester, but I'm still fine tuning. So I would say that it probably takes more than two semesters. So um, that would be my guess. Uh, that's my assessment is that just be prepared for the learning to continue, continue to happen. Um, I tell my students that I'm learning along with them, especially when we talk about Canvas. I say, we're in this boat together. I'm learning. I am receptive to your feedback. That's why we have evening meetings. And um, it takes a little while. But I would say that I have fine tuned my worldview that assignment, which is an alternative assessment, I've been doing that since 2015, and I've been doing it in perceptive since 2017, and that I think is is fine tuned. So I would say I probably fine tuned that within three or four semesters. But it it that one is a larger scale, so that one is a unit task. So I think Katrina might have a better answer than I do. I think some of them happen overnight. Like I'll just have a, a brain fart and uh, I'll be in the shower and I'll think of something and then I just put it on paper and it works and it works brilliantly. And then I have others, like I have a module that I have been developing over nearly six years now um, with 12 different incarnations and every, every semester I tweak it a little bit more um, just to make it exactly what I want it to be. Sometimes the, what you expect and what the students read are two different things and I always want them to aim high and they don't quite get, they can't read my brain and I'm not saying it right. So uh, I just have to rewrite it a few more times or explain it more or have a better way of doing it. I'm constantly um, changing them up or refreshing them. It's very rare that one just goes straight back into the pile the next semester. 
um, and uh, gets re just regurgitated verbatim. We're about out of time for the formal part of this. We'll switch to Q&A, but before we shut down this part, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share if there's one piece of, of advice you could give that we really haven't touched on yet today, what would that be for faculty that are considering implementing some alternative assessment method? I think for me, at the beginning of the semester, I take time talking about how learning happens, what learning actually looks like from a learning sciences perspective. We, I have a whole lesson on um, how learning actually happens, and I explain the pedagogy, I explain the reasoning behind everything we're doing. I try to be very transparent with them, I try to map everything out. So back to the learning objectives. So they know going in what, why they're doing everything that they're doing. So I think communication and transparency and also just helping them to learn about learning because regardless of what field they go into, I think it's important that they understand the principles behind learning. Yeah, um, that's something that I've been doing all along and Katie and I have had long discussions about this. I engage in what I call metapedagogy. I don't know where I got that term from a couple of years ago, but it basically means telling the students why I'm doing what I'm doing and what I hope to achieve so we can have a conversation at the end of the activity and say, did you achieve that? Or do you feel like you achieved that? And I know that that's not quantitative, it's more qualitative, but it's, a it's an ongoing conversation with them all the time about metapedagogy. The second a bit of advice is, is the same thing I did with active learning, is start really small. So you still might have your uh, regular kind of um, uh, assessment that you're used to, but interject in one semester just um, two or three little um, quick tasks throughout the semester and give them, make them low stakes assignments, make them 5% of the grade and do four of them. So 20% of the grade is, is as a quick task and then develop four little quick tasks that you can put through the semester that actually get the students to do something, to apply what they've learned to something that really interests them. So I call them QTs, you can call them whatever you want them to be, um, but give them some assignment and give them some latitude for creativity. Um, and that's how I'd start. All right, great session. I wanna thank our guests, Drs. Katie Stoddard and Dr. Katrina Laporte for being with us today. And the center team members that were supporting us, uh, monitoring questions in chat, and all of our participants, we really appreciate you being with us on this Friday afternoon. We're going to close recording now.